Ted Mervis, partner of Wachtel Lipton, Katz and Rosen, please. Thank you, and, and may I first thank, thank Zohar and Ono and Columbia for being here. This brings to mind a conference, I think in this same room I attended maybe over 10 years ago where the subject was whether to create, whether Israel should create a business court. And surprisingly, at least to me, was the presentation of then Chief Justice Aaron Barak, who spoke rather strongly against the idea. If I understood the Chief Justice's main point, it was that there should be no specialized courts of any kind, no, no family courts, no labor courts, no rabbinic courts, because the argument was all issues across all disciplines come down to a single question of reasonableness. Uh, and so no judge, not steeped in the study of reasonableness in the constitutional law sense, should be a judge. And any judge who deeply understood reasonableness could decide any case with no specialization required. Uh, several of us gave a, tried to give the Delaware perspective. I can't say that we met. Well, we certainly didn't blunt. I don't know if we even met the Chief Justice's point. But in any event, uh, it has been remarkable to watch from too great a distance the business court take root here and to see many of the decisions and, and the great interest of Israeli jurors, practitioners, and law students in the development of, of uh, Delaware's, Delaware's legal doctrine. Given the pedigree of the panel and the people who spoke before me, I would not presume to speak about substantive law. I don't think anyone here would be interested in my views on that. I know I'm not. Um, but I would hope to make a few comments on procedural practices in Delaware from the foxhole perspective of a litigator, uh, which may or may not have resonance here. And I would take as a theme that the procedural practices in Delaware have significantly shaped the development of the substantive doctrines of the fiduciary duty of directors, proving once again the wisdom of something I remember from my first day of law school, uh, an observation by Sir Henry Sumner Maine, that the substantive law has at first the look of being gradually secreted in the interstices of procedure. The key, the key doctrines, many of which have been mentioned today that have been developed in Delaware over the last 40 years, have been developed principally through decisions decided on motions for preliminary injunction not decisions after trial. That is, when a stockholder or a participant in a corporate control fight invokes the court's equitable jurisdiction and seeks an injunction before trial to stop or modify a transaction or a scheduled vote. In that context, the court assesses the probability of success on the merits, but does not rule definitively on the merits, and judges whether there is irreparable harm, a threat, a sufficient threat of irreparable harm, and a balancing of the overall equities that would support judicial intervention and support, in short, whether courts should throw the injunction flag and stop play. But in one important respect, Delaware practice on preliminary injunction differs from the typical practice in our federal courts in the United States and most other states. Delaware does not have live testimony on motion for preliminary injunction. There are no live hearings, just attorney argument. People like me stand up for hours and hours, get beat over the head, and, and try to make our points. But no director takes the stand and testifies about why he or she did what they did or proposed to do. No director comes into court and explains his or her views on what's going on. The factual record is all paper, depositions, documents, now emails, affidavits, and everyone understands the affidavits are written, they're written by the lawyers, not by the affiants. No, shocker, shocker. <laughs> um, but, but we have one advantage, which is that the basic facts of a transaction are really, I think it's fair to say, not really in dispute. Because the basic transactional facts are laid out in the SEC filings of disclosure requirements of the federal agency, either in the proxy statement, in the tender offer statement, or in the target schedule 14D9. But the chancellor has the burden of ruling without looking any director in the eye, without hearing their live testimony, without any demeanor evidence, and in this category, I put Unical, Revlon, Newmont, Time Warner, QVC, Paramount, all decisions decided in the somewhat cramped procedural context of a preliminary injunction. Unical, of course, was, I think, one of the greatest inventions of Delaware in the last 40 years. Uh, it created the concept of an enhanced scrutiny for unilateral defensive conduct of directors by asking whether directors had identified a threat to corporate policy and effectiveness and whether, if they had, the defensive action is, quote unquote, reasonable in relation to the threat posed. Justice Barack was not very far off. An analysis that looks to price, nature, timing of the offer, impact on shareholders, communities, creditors, employees, 
But prior to UNICAL, which is after all, it's not only 1985, prior to UNICAL, the argument was, should unilateral defensive conduct be subject only to the ordinary business judgment rule, the very deferential test? Would the, should the plaintiff have to prove, and this was the argument we made on behalf of directors, should the plaintiff have to prove that the director's sole or primary motivation was entrenchment or some other evil motive? UNICAL swept all that aside and made everything objective. There's nothing in UNICAL about object director's motives, no inquiries into their minds or hearts. The rationale was, as, as the Chief Justice mentioned, referring to uh, Mr. Putin, whether there's an omnipresent specter of possible entrenchment motive, not whether that is the motive of these particular directors. And that gave the court the license to engage in heightened scrutiny and judge for itself whether the action was taken by the directors was reasonable in the judge's objective sense. And keep in mind, UNICAL approved what to my mind was the most intrusive defensive conduct ever undertaken by a board of directors. The target company made a discriminatory self-tender offer, took corporate funds, paid them out to the stockholders to repurchase shares, but excluded the bidder, Mr. Pickens, shares, who owned, I think, something like 10% of the shares. It's the only takeover defense I know of that inflicted an economic penalty on a stockholder whose sin was launching a tender offer that the target company directors had deemed inadequate in price and unfair in structure because it was a partial offer. But here you had, at the same time that the court approved that defense, there was a huge empowerment of the Delaware courts to engage in objective, I think it's fair to call, substantive review of defensive conduct unilaterally taken by directors in the takeover context. Then came Revlon, I think in the same kind of vein, also on a preliminary injunction motion. Again, the test announced avoided any inquiry into motive. Uh, it simply adopted the now familiar test that directors, when they decide to sell the company, must have a plan that is reasonably designed to achieve the highest value reasonably available. Uh, and these doctrines were then worked out uh, to some degree in additional preliminary injunction decisions in Newmont, Time Warner, and QVC Paramount. Uh, on a related point, I think every litigator here would agree that the procedure can affect outcomes. Uh, my firm typically represents target companies and their boards, not bidders. We've, we've come to believe over time that trials are very favor are more favorable to the defensive side of a case. One striking example was in 1986 when Revlon was being litigated in Delaware on a paper record, the exact same case was being litigated in the federal court in New York in the SCM case on a hearing. Same case, a spurned bidder was seeking to undo a crown jewel lockup option granted by the target board, which was favoring uh, an insider management buyout. We all know what happened in Revlon. Uh, it was enjoined in the Court of Chancery, and that injunction was affirmed by the Supreme Court. SCM was litigated, as I said, in the federal court in New York. Hansen Trust was a hostile bidder, and there was a three-day live hearing. Lord Hansen, I remember, that was the leader of the hostile bid, and that gave my partner my litigation partner, Bernie Nussbaum, the chance to ask, I think, what became his most famous question in his entire trial practice. He put Lord Hansen on the stand, and his first question to him was in front of a packed courtroom, so Lord Hansen, what exactly does a lord do? Uh, he, he didn't get much of an answer. <laughs> and, and we won. We won that case in the trial court. Now, it was reversed in the Second Circuit, but we did win 50% of the time. <laughs> um, but, and I would put the decision that's been mentioned here, MFW, in, in much the same vein. Because MFW was a case where uh, we're working out the fiduciary duty of directors in a controlling stockholder buyout situation. Uh, before MFW, the conventional wisdom was that if you had a controlling stockholder deal that was approved, has been mentioned either by an independent uh, committee of independent directors or a majority of the minority of the public stockholders, the entire fairness form of review would continue to apply, but there would be a shift in the burden from the, de from the defendants to the plaintiff. And that burden shift was sometimes thought to be outcome determinative, or at least it gave courts a tool to deal with these kinds of cases in the helter-skelter of a preliminary injunction practice. 
I have to say it was very, before MFW, it was very hard for us lawyers to explain to a client what the state of the law was. We tell our client, well, if you're a controlling stockholder and you want to buy out the minority, you need to set up a special committee. You're going to have to pay millions of dollars in fees for it to hire its own lawyers, its own investment bankers. You're going to go through months of hellish negotiations. The controlling stockholder would say, I don't understand. I own control, right? I did buy the shares. I didn't steal them. All the other stockholders bought knowing I was in control, right? And you'd say, yes, that's all true, but the law imposes a special duty on you because you have control. Control and stockholder think about it and say, well, okay, if I do what you say and I go ahead with a special committee with all these bells and whistles, then there can be no litigation against me, right? And you're going to say, well, <laughs> not exactly. Well, I can't be sued, can I? Oh, oh, yes, you can be sued, and you will be sued. Indeed, in the United States today, as a 95% of all deals, all deals get sued, not just conflict transactions, including non-conflict transactions. And most of the time, more than once, and probably even in more courts, more than one court. But the controlling stockholder would then say, but of course, you can get the case dismissed on motion, right? Before I have to pay for email discovery, which can cost millions of dollars, just, you know, there's, there's a great asymmetry in, in litigation in the United States. Stockholders can serve a two-page document to man and impose millions of dollars of costs on major U.S. public companies, and stockholders themselves have no documents, so they have no reason not to do that. So this controlling stockholder says, well, I can get the case dismissed before that happens. Well, you'd have to say, not likely, it's an entire fairness case. It's a controlling stockholder things for a minute and says, so what, what exactly am I getting? I have a special committee. It's going to cost me millions of dollars out of my own pocket, months of delay. What do you get? You say, oh, you get a burden shift. <laughs> controlling stockholder says, what's a burden shift? <laughs> well, litigator says, well, it, it's a good question. What it really means is if the evidence is perfectly balanced, if there's equal poise, you probably will win. <laughs> At that point, the controlling stockholder says, equal poise? What's equal poise? At that point, you say, I'm sorry you're breaking up. I can't hear you. <laughs> and, and you hang up. Um, at least MFW, and I think it was responding to a, a perceived procedural need, created a clear path to get to the business charge rule and, and to get cases like this dismissed. Uh, I'd like to mention quickly two related developments recently in Delaware that I think fit into this same pattern. One is a decision by the Delaware Supreme Court um, on May 14th, two, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, in a case called Cornerstone Therapeutics, which held for the first time cleaning up and clarifying an area of the law uh, that said that even an entire fairness case, that is one in which there was a controlling stockholder buyout uh, that did not follow the MFW playbook, Disinterested directors can be dismissed out of the case on motion before trial uh, based upon an exculpatory provision in a company's charter. Now, as you probably know, director exculpatory provisions are extremely common in the United States. They were adopted in the wake of the Dino insurance crisis from the TransUnion decision in 1985. TransUnion was a case that held directors personally liable in damages for voting to approve a sale of the company at a 40% cash premium to market that was also approved by a stockholder vote. The base of the ruling was that the directors did not act with due care, and under the Delaware standard, they weren't just negligent, they were grossly negligent. As far as I know, TransUnion remains the only case ever in which directors have been held personally liable in the takeover field. Not for fighting a bid, not for thwarting a bid, but for selling the company at a 40% premium to market. As a result, there was a crisis in the DO market, and Delaware's legislature responded by authorizing Delaware corporations to approve charter provisions uh, that allowed stockholders to decide for themselves to exculpate their own directors from violations of the duty of care. Even grossly negligent behavior does not itself result in uh, liability for stockholders. Uh, in Cornerstone, the court held that stockholder plaintiffs cannot keep directors in the case if there is an exculpatory provision, uh, even an entire fairness case, unless they're able to plead facts which I don't believe is going to be very easy to do, unless they can plead facts that create a rational inference 
that the directors harbored self-interest adverse to the stockholders, and we're talking about independent directors now, <coughs> acted to advance self-interested the self-interest of an interested person from whom they could not be presumed to act independently or acted in, in bad faith. The one other case um, I'd like to mention because it's it I think it gives a gives a sense of the search. You got it. I give give me I give you one minute back. Uh, gives you, gives you a sense of the searching nature of heightened scrutiny in Delaware. It's a case called Nine Systems. In the decision after trial. <laughs> The Court of Chantry in September found that directors had breached their duties in approving a recap that favored a controlling stockholder. The court also found that the deal happened to be economically fair, even though the process was bad because the company's equity value was zero. Uh, nonetheless, three weeks ago on May 7th, the court awarded the plaintiff's lawyers $2 million in fees. There had been no benefit to the stockholders by the litigation, but the court reasoned that some award was appropriate to promote litigation against disloyal directors. Uh, but in reviewing the director's conduct in the merits decision after trial, the court focused with great scrutiny on the conduct of the board. It looked at the fact that directors had scheduled a key meeting, a key board meeting on a Friday afternoon in December, which prevented the attendance of one in independent director who was an Orthodox Jew and who opposed the deal. That director, the court said, and, and there are pages of the opinion spent on this. That director, the court said, had made his non-negotiable religious constraints known to the other directors from the get-go of his service on the board. And the court made a finding of fact that another board meeting that the directors had intentionally set the meeting on a Friday afternoon to prevent the director from attending. I don't know if judicial review can get more searching than that. I'm not even sure if the Sanhedrin would have gone that far. Uh, but I think the, the point I simply want to make is whether or not the Delaware experience on a procedural level has resonance here, from a litigator's perspective, many of the rules that get created are designed to deal with the problem of can cases be stopped at an early stage? Because the expense of going through discovery and trial is so huge and put such great pressure on the litigators to try to come up with ways to stop cases. I know litigators often make motions that are very thin to get cases dismissed, but they're under tremendous client pressure to do it. Uh, in any event, whatever, whether these ideas have resonance here or not, I think it's, uh, I think it's gonna continue to be interesting to see uh, your courts and our courts continue to learn from each other. Thank you very much.